name is Eileen Yangst, and um, I live four miles down the street on Julia's Way, and that's where I drive the Mars rovers. And I say rovers because there is more than one currently active on Mars. So let me first ask, how many people have seen The Martian so I, need, so I know if I should speak to this slide? How many people have seen the movie The Martian? Okay, a couple of you. So I will speak to this slide. Over here on your left, I just have to point out that on the right, you're gonna see the very first camera I ever worked on. Back when I was, I'm not gonna type old. Um, but still, still in grad school, moving on to postdoc. This is the camera that you supposedly see in the movie. Um, the, it's actually a really, really good movie, but there are two things that you need to know about that movie that are inaccurate. Number one, JPL in that movie looked like something out of Star Wars, right? With all this technology and woo! And it actually looks a little bit like 60s Tomorrowland, right? <laughs> I have a badge, right, with a little chip reader, but I go up to this thing and it's got this humongous light on it. And you put your badge there. Government funded, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't put money into stuff that is just bells and whistles. The other thing is the camera here, and at some point you see it on this big, humongous, sturdy, pillar-like thing. It is not accurate. This is what it's actually mounted on. It came in this little canister. It looks like a bunch of uh, wire coat hangers. That's very, very close to what it actually is. And so when, when Pathfinder landed, it unwound. You can see a video of it on YouTube. Just kind of like, kind of chink, chink like this. Locks itself in place. And then it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't move. It can't move again. But we can have a mass like this because although there's a lot of wind on Mars, there really is, and it's very fast, there isn't a lot of atmosphere. So you have very fast wind, but not a lot of molecules in that wind. So having a rickety old thing like this in 60, 80 mile an hour winds on Mars is just not a problem. There's just not a whole lot of force, not a lot of power behind that wind because the atmosphere is so thin. All right, now that I've burst everybody's bubble. So this is me, and so I'm putting up my bona fides here. Uh, I have an AB in physics and astronomy, and yes, it's an AB at Dartmouth because it's in Latin, so it's an AB instead of a BA. Um, I have a master's and a PhD in geological sciences from Brown University. Uh, I was an administrator of the Wisconsin Space Grant Consortium for 14 years. And I've been a researcher for 25. Some of those were concurrent, so as I say here, please don't do the math. <laughs> um, this is me at the recent eclipse. I'm in Tetonia. I am not making this up. It does have a view of the Grand Tetons. It is Tetonia, Idaho. I'm gonna pull out watching the eclipse here. But one of the reasons I like to do these talks is so that you can meet a scientist. <laughs> right? We have a tendency, uh, if, if we get our information from the media, to picture scientists in a certain way. Either as idiot savants who only care about data and can't really talk to people, or crazy people who want to take the world over. Um, none of these things is true for most of the people I know. And so, one of the reasons I like to give talks like this is so that the next time you see studies show, they say, whatever, that you actually have a person's face in your head. That they're, to remind yourself that there are actually people who do this, people with husband and kids and other interests outside of science and so on. So I admit to being a geek, and I'm actually going to show you one of the five existent pictures of me that screams geek. But I want to point out it's only one of five, OK? So there I am. I don't know if anyone can recognize what I'm wearing. This is a Starfleet uniform, but in my defense, it was Halloween. <laughs> All right. So the first thing I'd like to do is introduce the rover to you. 
And then I'd like to talk a little bit about why we're studying Mars in the first place, and then show you a few of the pictures. We'll be seeing the pictures uh, from Mars all the way through, but I'm going to show you some of the cool pictures from my camera, and then answer some questions. So this is the Curiosity rover, and the Curiosity rover is one of two that are currently active on Mars. Uh, this has been an interesting couple of weeks because this week I'm working on the Opportunity rover, and next week my shifts are on Curiosity. So, uh, lots of work on Mars. So, on Opportunity, one of the smaller rovers, one of the earlier rovers, Opportunity's job was to follow the water. Curiosity's job is to look for habitab habitable zones, places where life might have arisen, where life might have been able to thrive. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but let me, let me introduce you to the rover first. So this is where Curiosity is, and this is actually not, a, not just the western or the eastern hemisphere of Mars. This is the entire planet. It's kind of flattened out like a penny and scooshed so you can see the whole thing. So these are all of the places where we have had successful landings on Mars. Uh, Phoenix, Viking 1, Viking 2, those were in the 70s. Uh, Phoenix was uh, in the early 2000s. Pathfinder, 1997. Spirit and Opportunity, the two smaller rovers, and then Curiosity in that box. Only Spirit, Opportunity, and Curiosity are rovers. The others are landed, although Pathfinder did have a small rover with it, and I'll show you her in just a second. This is where we landed. This is Gale Crater. It's a big uh, impact crater, which just means that you know, we had a big rock hit Mars and leave a big hole in the ground. The cool thing, <coughs> about Gale Crater is that mound that you see on the side there. So um, this mound is actually a bunch of sediments. And I think my next picture shows that a little bit. Why do we care about that? Well, what those sediments tell you is something similar to what something like the Grand Canyon would tell you. Uh, if you've ever been out to the west, I uh, have seen either the Grand Canyon or other areas where you have, you know, Red Rocks of Sedona or something like that. You'll see stacks and stacks and stacks of horizontal or near horizontal layers. Each one of those layers represents a different geologic environment. So the more layers you have, the more environments you can understand. The thicker the stack, the further back in time you can go, right? Because the older ones are going to typically be on the bottom, the younger ones on top. The thicker that stack, the more layers you have to look at, the further back in time you can go. So that mound in Gale Crater is stacks and stacks of sediment, just like you might see out in the southwest. So it's a very interesting place for us to go to understand a big history of Mars, a long history of Mars, in one package. Okay, this is one of my favorite pictures because this is JPL, this is the Jet Propulsion Lab, and you can see the sort of 60s architecture in the background. The one thing you don't see is anything that gives you a sense of scale. There's not even a trash can in this picture. So it's difficult to really, you've got these three rovers, but if you've never actually stood in front of the rovers, you don't know how big they are. So what I've done is inserted a picture of me with the smaller rover, Opportunity, over there on the left. So that's me many, many other years ago, uh, with Opportunity. And you can see how much taller Curiosity is compared to me. This is a very big rover. Opportunity, um, solar powered, four instruments, hardy little instruments. Curiosity over on the right, Nuclear powered because it has so many more instruments, because it's so much larger, but it also can go a lot farther and do a lot more things. It actually has a lab inside the rover itself. Giving you an idea of some of the instruments here, what you see in the box there are two eyes, 
two camera eyes. And if anyone is a photographer, as a hobby, no, but yay, oh, people, okay. So, as a photographer, you understand that there is a trade-off between resolution, how clear the picture is, right, uh, and field of view, how much you can see in one shot. So you can see two eyes, and you can see they have different apertures there, they have different fields of view, different resolutions. So one of them is designed to take lots of easily downloadable pictures right, of a lot. They're not as clear, and their, their resolution isn't as good. But that allows us to drive a long distance within that, you know, within that picture, because we can only go as far as we can see. Um, and it allows us to get more information down quickly, because those pictures don't contain as many bits. They're not as big, their data volume isn't as big. The other one gives us close-up pictures, better resolution, you can see things more clearly, but it's a narrower field. So we're constantly making decisions about which camera we're going to use to take images of whatever we're trying to understand. Do we spend the time and the data volume to get a, a better resolution picture, or is a bigger field of view more important? You'll see, too, that it's kind of up on this mast. And it's up on that mast um, so that we can, it's basically shorthand. Scale is a really, really difficult thing to understand on a different planet when you have no frames of reference at all. You know, no telephone poles in the background, nothing like that. I can show you a picture and say, well, is this rock the size of a football or is it the size of a house? sometimes very difficult to tell. The rover is a little over six feet tall. What that means is that any picture we take, we have in the back of our heads, as human beings, we make that connection automatically. You're about this tall, give or take. So that when you see those pictures, you know, they're not coming from down here or from way, way up here. We don't have to make those mental calculations. Um, the rover is about as tall as a person, and that just makes it easier for us. This big brown thing is the ChemCam, and that's a chemistry camera. So this is the camera that can zap rocks. I don't know how many of you have followed the mission at all. There is a laser on this mission, and this is the instrument that has the laser. So. We like to see pictures of the rocks, but we also want to know what they're made of. And that's hard to do just from pictures. It's actually hard to do unless you're touching the rock with your sensor. Well, this makes it a little easier for us. So instead of actually coming into contact with the rock, we'll zap it with a laser. And what is created is a plasma. It basically burns the rock off. So there's a poof of plasma. With plasma, it's just a gas, it's easy to measure. So you zap the rock, you measure the plasma, and that gives you an idea of the percentage of each of the little minerals that are in that rock without ever having to touch it. I think I have an artist rendition to that. You can't actually see the laser, but this gives you the idea that from four to six meters away, right, so six to nine feet, you can, uh, that's not right, 6, 3, 18, uh, 10 to 20 feet, I'm so used to using metric, I'm sorry, uh, 10 to 20 feet away, you can pinpoint a rock, zap it, and then measure it with the chem cam and figure out what it's made of. It's really cool. It's the first time we've ever sent anything like this out. I'm going to grab a quick sip of water here. So one of the things we like to be able to do is understand the weather on Mars. And these little booms allow us to take weather measurements, wind temperature, pressure, wind speed, wind direction. So I can tell you what the weather is on Mars, at least the day after. So the instrument on the left is, the one, is one of the instruments that's on the arm of the rover. The other two on the right are inside the rover. So Curiosity's 
official name is Mars Science Laboratory, MSL. The reason it's called Mars Science Laboratory is because it's the first time we have been able to fly some of these really complex um, laboratory instruments to Mars. That's one of the reasons we have to run it on nuclear power, because these kinds of instruments um, are big power hogs. So um, unlike Spirit and Opportunity, there's a little plug of plutonium on MSL, about the size of a pencil eraser. And that's what powers the entire rover. This is my camera. The camera itself is on the left. And a picture that that camera took on Earth to test it is on the right. The thing that I am really interested in is little tiny grains. If you're on the beach, those sand grains, I'm the one that's staring right at them, trying to figure out the shape and the color and so on of each one of them. That's what really appeals to me. And the reason it does is because each of those little grains tells you a story. For some, it tells you that they have been knocked off of bedrock and then kind of sit there. So they're rough around the edges. They have a very angular shape. For some of them, they've been ground down, at least on Earth, some of them have been ground down by glaciers. And they have these conchoidal fractures and they have these twists and they have uh, very specific types of uh, point ends and so on. So you can tell just by looking at the grain how it got there. For others, for ones that have been beaten around by the wind, they tend to be frosted. They tend to be rounded and maybe a couple of little pop marks, you know, from another grain hitting them, but they tend to be uh, much more rounded. So just looking at these tiny little grains, I can tell you something about what they are, how they got there. So that's what I'm interested in. Um, you know, this is a picture maybe that big across size of a postage stamp. So those are the pictures that my camera takes. And it does that from the end of an arm. The arm is about two meters or six feet long. It weighs, I can't remember if it's 50 or 100 kilos, but you know, one to 200 pounds. It's a big arm, it's got five joints, very complex to move. My camera sits out on the end of that arm. One of the things that was our job was to take pictures of various parts of the rover once we landed so that we could check the rover out, make sure it still you know, it survived landing and everything that you might expect. <coughs> but this is the first picture that my camera took of the mass cam. And that's, you remember, there's your two eyes, there's your cam cam, kind of as a hat, big eye on the top. I'm going to tell you a story about this picture that is not well known. So the rover is a complex piece of machinery. It's brand new. It had been designed from almost from scratch using what we've learned from the other rovers that you saw, the little Sojourner rover and the you know, Spirit and Opportunity rovers. We learned things and we brought them into our uh, design of curiosity. But a lot of that stuff is brand new. We went from wheels this big to wheels that big, for example. We uh, went from solar power and all that entails to nuclear power and everything that that entails. And the weight that that adds to the vehicle. The vehicle, we've gone from, say, a golf cart sized rover to one the size of a car. Very large. So, a lot of those designs are happening almost right up until the point where you're wrapping that thing up and putting it on the spacecraft. Our camera was designed much sooner, a little less complex than the entire rover chassis itself. So what that meant was that when we designed our camera, we expected it to be mounted in a certain spot. It ended up not being mounted in the same spot that we were expecting. You can see, for one, that the image is a little cockeyed. Well, that's because the way we were mounted originally was a little cockeyed. You can also see that it looks 
dusty. So this image was taken early, early on in the mission. It's one of the first images we took. And our camera has a dust cover. Mars is dusty. It is very, very, very dusty. That was, that's totally accurate. It's a very dusty place. So we had a, um, a lens cover. The lens cover, you can see right through. It's a sapphire window. So absolutely transparent. The idea being that you could protect your lens and still take pictures through the dust cover for as long as you could. And then, you know, if, if there was damage to the dust cover, you could finally open the dust cover and, and take pictures without it. This is an image with the dust cover on. So when the camera was mounted to the rover, mounted to the arm, and the arm was kind of folded in the way it was supposed to be folded in, it was not something we were expecting, but all of the optics were facing out. Right? All the lens and everything was facing out. And if you followed how we landed, we came screaming through the atmosphere at some ridiculous speed. The, 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 um, um, the, the heat shield pops off. The rover comes down. There's a sky crane, and there's a big, long tether that the rover's hanging from, and then it sets down, and retro rockets fire, and then the sky crane flies away. The point being that when those retro rockets fire, it kicks up a bunch of dust. Well, that's why our lens cover is completely dusty. And when we saw this picture, we didn't actually know was the lens cover dusty? Or was the lens cover gone? Had it been melted away? We have no idea. Was it blown off? And we're looking at the lens, meaning that this is the way we're going to be taking pictures for the rest of the mission. We had no idea at the time. This is the reverse of the picture I just showed you. This is the camera on the mast. This is mast cam taking a picture of our camera. It's known as the Mars Hand Lens Imager. This is the arm, the end of the arm with all of its instruments. And this is our camera right here. You can see these two little lights. These are LED lights so that we can illuminate a target. And this shape right here, that's the lens cover. So this hinge right here is the hinge for opening the lens cover. And it's a little hard to see from here, but it was easy for us who had built the camera to notice right away that that lens cover was intact. So this was a huge, huge deal for us when this picture came down. About 30, 31 sols, or Martian days, into the mission. That's when we finally knew we had a camera that was going to work the way we designed it to. As I said, our camera is mounted on the end of this big, humongous arm, six, seven feet long. Uh, the arm has, as I said, five joints, right? And so anytime we have to use our camera, this is the kind of motion that we have to plan out. You have to know where the rover is. You have to know where the surface is. You have to know where any rocks are on the surface. Um, you have to know where the arm is and all of its joints at all times. So it's extremely complex. There are about five people in the world who are at any one time uh, certified to be able to run this. So this is it taking a bunch of pictures of the rover itself. I love watching this because I like watching Tai Chi. I don't know if anybody takes Tai Chi, but I just love watching this <laughs> thing move. Because sometimes you have to flip the whole arm around and you can't just do it. You've got to flip the joint around. It's just really, really awesome to watch. And these men and women can place our camera to a rock within one centimeter. One centimeter. Something like that. Which is saying something because, again, you're looking at a lot of weight, a lot of moving parts, and a lot of vibration, which is what you're not seeing here. So when you move the arm, it actually vibrates. It shakes, just like anything else, right? When you move something like that, it's going to have a little vibration at the end. They planned for that. 
They plan for all of that. They, they figured all that out, and they can get us down, in some cases, to less than a centimeter to the target that they want to image. So I am in, in, in just amazing awe of, of the engineers that I work with. All right, so I hope I've gotten you a little excited about the Zippy Little Rover that I get to work with. Um, but I get this question somewhat often. I suspect that you're here because you think Mars is cool, right? Not everybody, but I suspect that that might be what's going on. But before, before I go that direction, let me tell you again a story that's not well known. I'm a geologist, and I was working out in the field three months before we landed. And I have uh, many engineering friends. And I was working with some engineers trying to um, get an idea of how the next rover might work. So I'm down on the ground doing what geologists do, playing in the dirt, whatever. And two of my friends, engineering friends, are talking over my head. You know how sometimes doctors talk over your head? If you're prone, there's no possible way your ears work, right? Same thing, I'm on the ground. Fiddling, two guys talking over me. And one of them says, So, how about that rover? Yep. Yeah, that sky crane. Did you see how it was, you know, running? Yeah. What do you think? 50 50. I'm right here. I'm right here, and you're telling me, Yeah, you know. Some of the engineers that I really respect are like, ah, 50-50, my plan, my crash, you know, this is my job. When we actually landed successfully, this is what my friend Dean sent to me about five minutes after we landed. <laughs> <laughs> this was the general sense for a lot of people. A lot of moving parts on this one. Anyway, so why go to Mars? These are some of the reasons that you will hear in my community. Mars is the next step into space. The moon is very close. It's a stepping stone, but Mars is the next step. We're not going to be landing on Venus with people anytime soon. It's, you know, it can melt. The temperature is you know, hot enough to melt lead on the surface. That's not going to happen. Um, next closest is Mars, right? Mars be helps us better understand Earth-like environments, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And of course, Mars is a geologist's paradise. It's an awesome place to go and, and, and study. Um, but let me talk about this Earth-like environment. What does that mean, Earth-like environments? Well, I suspect that this is science talk for what's in the back of a lot of people's heads, which is, Mars is cool because there might have been life there, right? The four-letter word, life. That makes it exciting. That makes it fraught, right, with, with, with import. So what, when we say Earth-like, what do we mean? What do we as scientists mean? Um, it's not as simple as it sounds, because even Earth was not Earth-like for a lot of its own history. When we say Earth-like, typically in our heads, we're thinking it can support life, right? Well, early Earth could not have supported life. Early Mars, that's a different story. So I'm showing four different, four different bodies here. On the far left, that's uh, Enceladus. It's a moon of Saturn. The next one up is Europa, a moon of Jupiter. Titan which is another moon of Saturn. It's the only moon that we are aware of that has a significant atmosphere. And then up here is Mars. These are all places where liquid water may now or may once have existed, except for Titan. That's a little different. We won't get too deep into Titan. We're talking liquid methane there, but if you're a biologist, you really hep up on Titan. So focusing on Enceladus Europa, Mars, these are all places where liquid water once did or may now be present. Why is liquid water important? Without getting into my little diatribe about how unique water is. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to give you 
that little story is one of my favorites. But water is a unique molecule that allows life to um, thrive. And for someone like me, Mars has the most Earth-like geology. So if you're trying to understand Earth, Mars is actually a good place to go. So for example, if you are a, um, a medical doctor, um, I may not want to visit you if you have only seen one patient in your entire life. If you are someone who has only seen one person your entire life, you may have a good idea of what the average person looks like. The average person has a head, two arms, two legs. You might be able to figure out by snapping, you know, and, and this is where they hear from. You might be able to figure out how people see. But if you've only seen one person in your life, you may assume that all people are five foot six, that all people are women, that all people have dark hair or slightly reddish hair or whatever. If you've only seen one person, you have no context. Mars gives us context for understanding the right questions to ask about Earth. It's one of the reasons I studied other planets. When we say it helps us understand Earth better, this is why. Because without having the context of what's normal and what's not, we don't know what to ask. So here are some of the processes that occur on Mars, or have occurred on Mars. These are all processes, all geologic processes that have occurred or do occur on Earth now. Lava flows, volcanism, right? Volcanoes. Plenty of past volcanoes on Mars. Sedimentary, that's just a fancy way of saying you've broken rock down, transported it somewhere else. Fluvial, that's the geologic term for moving something by water. Glacial, you know what that means. Aeolian, from the god of wind, Aeolus. So traveling by wind. Erosional and depositional land forms. You take a bunch of sediment, you dump it someplace, and you have a depositional land form. You take a bunch of sediment away, and you have an erosional land. So the Grand Canyon is an erosional, fluvial erosional landform. The, the water came through, wore down the rocks, and you get this canyon. Impacts. We actually have a lot of impacts on Earth. We have uh, craters on Earth that were formed by impact. Most of them, the obvious ones, have been you know, worn away because our planet is so active. On Mars, there are a lot more impacts to look at. And then mass movements. This is just stuff moving downhill because of gravity. That's what that means. But all of these things we have evidence for on Mars. So lots of volcanic features. So on the bottom here, this is Olympus Mons. You'll see that all of these lovely features have Latin names. This is because Latin was the language uh, of scholarship for hundreds of years. Um, so everybody spoke Latin if you study. So Olympus Mons, Mount Olympus. Um, this is about the size of the state of Arizona. And that hole in the top, the caldera, this is where the lava used to come out, that hole is about the size of the state of Rhode Island. So it's really, really big. On the other hand, if you look at the picture up above, that's Mauna Loa on Earth. And the profile of these two mountains is almost identical broad, low, what's called a shield volcano, because they were made in the same way, from very low viscosity, uh, so easily, uh, e easy to flow, right? So, you know, same as your car, engine oil viscosity, low viscosity lavas that run for a really, really long distance and then build up this low, broad mountain. Here are lava tubes. Here's one in Hawaii. That's my friend Kathy. And then lava tubes on Pavonis Mons. Again, Mount Pavonis on Mars. On the left is a target we call Link, and I don't remember why. 
On the right is something very similar on Earth. This is called a conglomerate. This is what happens when you've had a lot of water beating up rocks and making them rounded, knocking off the corners and transporting them, and then dumping them somewhere where they have lithified, that is, become rock themselves. This mixed up sort of, 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 of uh, different types and sizes of sediment. On the left, these little rounded pebbles. On the right, rounded pebbles on Earth. And what this suggests is that the same process that made the stuff on Earth, huge water flow that uh, wore down these pebbles, is the same thing that happened on Mars. There are a lot of features that were made by flowing water that we can see on Mars. Um, I'm just showing one here on the right, this is Hale Channel. On the left, this is a channel in Yemen. These are both places that are essentially uh, desert right now. But if you get a lot of water flowing at once, you'll get these beautiful patterns of a really heavy, thick channel that then sort of spreads out in, into the desert. And again, we have two active planets. Earth is obviously much more active than Mars, um, but we have two types of gullies here. So one on the left, um, that's in Duncasa Crater. And on the right, this is at the same image taken three years later, a little less than three years later. And you can see a new channel has formed here. On Earth, what, what typically happens when you form gullies, this is a picture of gullies in Iceland, is you have a cliff face where you have um, a relatively frozen layer underneath and then you have soil above it or unconsolidated material above it. And that ice melts when the sun hits it. And when that happens, all the stuff on top, as the water starts to seep out, the stuff on top starts to come down too because it no longer has that ice to, to, to keep it there. So you get these beautiful gullies that form. Um, again, we assume, and we are trying to, to understand this, but if you see them this way on Earth, are they forming with the same process on Mars? And clearly, something is still forming these, whether it's water, whether it's CO2, we're not sure. Here are some dunes. This is Namib dune taken in December of 2015, so just a couple of years ago. Uh, transverse dunes on two planets. The one on the bottom is uh, Mars, the one on the top. Uh, oh, they're both Mars, but you'll get transverse dunes on Earth as well. Anytime you have areas where you don't have a whole lot of vegetation to anchor those dunes, you often end up with transverse dunes. And here are two dust devils, one on the left, this is actually one from Opportunity. Opportunity has, for some reason, seen the best dust devils. And then on the right, uh, one from Arizona. Here are two atmospheric disturbances, very similar. This beautiful mushroom shape, the one at the top is Mars. The one at the bottom, you get this mushroom shape as sand is being blown off of the Sahara into the Atlantic Ocean. But um, and here, let me, it's a little hard to see it because of the lighting, but you can see this mushroom shape here, and then you can start seeing it here with the curl around right there. I'm going to take that down. If I do, I'm really sorry. So this is down at the level that I'm really interested in. You can see the little bar down there is two or three millimeters. So these are tiny, tiny pieces. Right? These are hand samples. But on the bottom, you have something from the Spirit Rover. On the top, you have something from Lava Butte in Oregon. And these are both samples of scoria. This is just uh, lava that was came out sort of spattering. You know, if you've ever shaken up a Coke bottle and you take your finger off and it goes That is essentially the gas inside disrupting the liquid. The same thing happens in a volcano. And that's what you're seeing here. It's just that with rock, it freezes pretty quickly on contact with air, and so you see the residue uh, frozen in time. <coughs> but again, 
Earth, Mars, probably made the same way. All right, so I have a few more minutes, and I want to give you some of the ideas, uh, some of the pictures that my own camera has taken, and some of the things that we have found out because of it. Boiling water! We kind of expected that this would be the case, but we've never seen evidence at this level. So on the left is Mars from an area called Barden Bluffs. On the right is a sandstone on Earth, and the arrows are pointing to these little teeny grains that are connected to each other. It's called grain grain contact, They're right on top of each other. And this is what can often happen when you're forming a conglomerate stuff, is washing through, um, taking a whole different, you know, a whole range of sizes of grains, dumps them all in one place, um, and then lithifies. So again, a sandstone over here on Earth, and then one over here on Mars, both formed from flowing water. We also think that Gale Crater is an ancient lake bed. One of the things we were trying to find out was whether there were any areas on Mars that were once habitable, meaning life might have been happy there. A lake bed is a nice place to be because you get water, energy typically from the sun through the water. Um, as long as you have the building blocks that you need to put together copies of yourself, it's a nice place to be because it's quiescent. It is hard to be really relaxed if you're a bacterium or something like that and you're being washed around by waves or whatever. A lake is a nice, quiescent, quiet place to be. So a lake is a potential habitable place. And when you look at these rocks, they are mudstones. That, yay, that's really exciting. Well, what that means is that the grains are so small that we can't resolve them. And we designed our cameras specifically so that if you couldn't resolve the grains, they were at a size that meant they had to have settled through water. Settled down, not washed in, but settled down quiescently through the action of a lake. Oh, oh, and oftentimes you get, you know, on Earth at least, you get shales. That is a very, very fine grain stone, right? What we're looking at here, again, very, very fine grain stone, probably settled in a quiescent water environment. This is this beautiful glow here. That's rock that's been polished by blowing sand, so wind action. Uh, this is called Newport Ledge uh, because there was a point in uh, our activities where we had gone through a section that we were calling the Bar Harbor Quad. So all the names are main related. <laughs> so and this is so cool because we have Google now. If you type in a Gunkwood Beach, half the pictures of the bars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is just a layered clasp, which suggests, again, that you had some sort of potential fluvial action. Could be wind action, could be fluvial, depending on the grain size. But again, this was one that we took while we were in the Bar Harbor Quad. Uh, technically named after Chamberlain Lake. <laughs> really after Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. <laughs> So let me show you where we are now. So each of these little squares is called a quadrant, or quad for short. Uh, they're about a kilometer on the side, a little over a kilometer on each side. And they were mapped prior to our landing so that we would have an idea of the context, again, context being very important, of where we were and what we would expect to see. Each of those quads was named after, and I did not I'm not making this up. Each quad is named after a geologic formation that shares a name with a small town of less than 5,000 people. There you go. That's where those names came from. So you'll see, so you'll see Yellowknife. That's, that's the quad where we landed. Next to it is Quincy. Below it. 
a bunch of names that were really hard to, to, to pronounce because a lot of them came from South Africa. Kimberly Hanover, that's actually for Hanover, New Hampshire. That was one of the quads I mapped. Uh, and you keep going down and down and down, and right below Windhoek, you will see Bar Harbor, where we spent a significant amount of time. So if you are ever interested in any of the islands, there's a Deer Island, there's a Peaks Island, uh, who has had kids that has, have gone through the middle school, anyone? Uh, there's a Birch Island, there's a Bailey's Island, there's a Group Diamond Island. These are all islands that, that, that uh, are used at the middle school. Anyway, now a lot of times, again, when you Google those names, half of your pictures will come from Maine and the other half will come from Mars. <laughs> All right. I did say I'd show you the first selfie. Here it is. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the face in there because of the light, but it's actually uh, Aldrin. Oh. Yeah, so that's Buzz Aldrin in there. Um, so this is a more recent selfie from the space station, and then this is our selfie. And I'm extremely proud of our selfie. Can you remember the picture I showed you, me in the Starfleet uniform, the other two people in that picture? The three of us were the ones that designed this observation.